All right, so Ben is back from Brazil. So let's give Ben a big round of applause. We've missed you, Ben, man. You, you, you're, you're way too long, too frequently, man. It's just, I missed you guys. I was surprised. I had no idea you were coming back um, until I got the text. Did you get, did you know? I did, yeah, I did. So it was a pleasant surprise to hear. You know, it, it softened the blow of Albert's, uh, you know, untimely loss. Uh, so when you said that you would be asked, I thought, oh, it's uh, so, it's so, so. Maybe even Ben will be there to help, help with the grief reboot process yeah. that we all have been experiencing. With pleasure. With pleasure. So, how, how did the Brazil trip go this time? Anything it, it exciting? It was good. It was good. But it, it's been a difficult six weeks or so because of my mom. I know, yeah. But she, she ended up like pulling out of it. Well, well, physically she's doing well, but mentally her cognition is so poor she can't put the months in order. Was it so, a stroke or what was it? No, a double amputation. Mm-hmm. Was it a, that was a like diabetic thing or uh, mm-hmm. cardiovascular problems? She smoked all her life. Yeah. Uh, and so she fell. Uh, the the wound um, wouldn't heal. Uh, wouldn't heal, and so they had to do one amputation below the knee that wouldn't heal. And then the decision was made, and I was and, and, and I think you followed a bit of that. Everyone wanted to let her die. Uh, yes, I might have saw that. Who said? Who said? No way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so the Lord uh, did some miraculous things. He softened some hearts. Uh, he woke up her mind, uh, like literally at the eleventh hour, uh, when it was just about to be too late to make a decision for life. And she, and luckily, uh, softened the heart of my younger brother and sister. And she replied, "Yeah, I want to live." And so they went ahead with the operation. Really? So they were able to communicate with her verbally? Uh, and yeah, otherwise she'd be dead right now. Mm-hmm. Really? Gracious. So they figured that, so they, they were Was she comatose at first? Or? Sorry? Was she in a coma at first? Or? No, no, but just confused because uh, you can imagine ever since she's 81 and you have major operations, which amputations are, you're put under general anesthesia mm-hmm. uh, and it's tough. In fact, I've, I've been learning more about it for some odd age. General anesthesia can mm-hmm. keep you really confused for not only weeks but months. Wow, mm-hmm. I'm glad it worked out. So it worked she's out. okay, but please continue praying for her so that her mind clears. Good. Uh, and, and we will do that. So, all right. So we finished up the rapture last week, man. We had a, you know, that 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 was the uh, series that would never end. It just so much stuff to it. It just kept building upon itself, and I thought, you know. As as we finished on a on a on a high note, you know, um, and some people, you know, think that the rapture season, the fall harvest season, is the time that the rapture occurs. So I thought it was appropriate we were able to finish up the rapture uh, right around the first week in September, and I thought we'd roll right in <coughs> to the Antichrist because the two end up being kind of related together, and it's unfortunate that there are some religious organizations out there. Like I said, I was listening. With Joe Chamel on, on his podcast this week, and uh, he's selling yet another rock and roll video. I was like, dude, if you were as enthusiastic about Bible prophecy yeah. as you are about rock and roll music and exposing Britney Spears is doing a new video, and it's satanic. New slash. Right? We knew that like 20 <laughs> years ago. You know, it, you know, it wouldn't destroy people's faith in the rapture. So I, I hope that we were able to lay out some foundational truths to counteract some of the what I would suggest are heresies being promoted by people who claim to be part of the body of Christ and who claim to be in the church. You know, I don't mind it so much when the Jehovah's Witnesses say to me that, oh, well, you know, the rapture, that was all made up in the 1800s, you know, by, you know, uh, Margaret McDonald and, uh, you know, some preacher from England. But when you hear it coming from people that claim to be born again Christians, you know, it, whether you want to interpret the verses that way or not, for you to say that, oh, well, it's, 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 it's a known fact that the rapture is a doctrine that was made up in 1862 by John Nelson Darby. When you can read John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3 for yourself, mm-hmm. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, you know, verses 15 through 18, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 48 through 52, you can read those yourself. And anyone with with a shred of intellectual honesty will say that I could see how somebody might think that that means that Jesus is coming in the air for his church 
and you've got to catch us up into the sky with the dead in Christ that are going to go first. So I think we laid that out, and I think we, 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 we foundationally defended the faith for the last four or five weeks in that area because Paul refers to the belief in the rapture as <clears throat> the blessed hope. It's not just, uh, uh, you know, what the critics of those of us that believe in the rapture, you know, it's the E word they always use, which one, you know? Yeah. No, the escapists. Oh, there you oh. go. It's like you guys are just escapists. Yeah. As if, you know, encountering the wrath of God is something that we would boldly look forward to. Why would you want to go to war with the God that died to save you? You know, they, they think that, oh, we're going to go and face the Antichrist, we're going to beat him up. And, and so, so the two end up going together, and we're going to learn who the Antichrist is and how the church's identity in the church's destiny is not to go to war with the Antichrist during the 70th week of Daniel, or the tribulation period, also known as the day of, not the day of the Antichrist, but the day of the Lord. Lord. It's the day of, not the Antichrist, right? But the day of the Lord's wrath. Right? The idea that's promoted by people like Joe Schmel and some of the Calvinists and Jehovah's Witnesses and all this, that we're going to, um, Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe in the, you know, the Antichrist and tribulation period in the same way, but you know, the idea that we're supposed to go through the tribulation period and we're gonna like take on the Antichrist and we're gonna punch him out and depending on how much faith we have, we're gonna beat him up and then Jesus can come back after we, if, you know, we, we take our, I guess, our punches like a man and then God will say, okay, they've suffered enough, go and, you know, in, in the fight now, you know. It's almost like a sort of Protestant purgatory. The idea of purgatory is promoted by the Catholic Church that says that after you die, you go, if you were a faithful member of the Catholic Church, you get to go to a place called, or you have to go to a place called purgatory, where, which is kind of like hell, where you suffer in flames of fire for however long it is to pay off the rest of the sin debt that you are. Jesus paid for some of it, but you've got to pay off the balance. So your balance bin is going to be six months in purgatory, whereas Steve, uh, well, <laughs> or, uh, his buddy Albert, but Albert, he went surfing too much. He's going to spend six or seven decades in purgatory. Well, I'm going to buy me a scapula. There you go. A scapula with a shorter time in half, according to the cans and the priests. You know, for those who don't know the scapula, it's a leather, it's a piece of leather that you wrap around your neck and it crosses the scapula blades with your bones in the shoulder. Okay. And that's why they call it the scapula, because it crosses the scapular bones of your uh, shoulders. Mm -hmm. And somehow, that act magically shortens your time. Oh, Genevieve. So the uh, purgatory was made up by the Catholics? Yes. Oh, okay. There's a Catholic doctrine that was created, I think, uh, 15, 60 something or other. Mm -hmm. Completely different than the rapture. See, you know, you get the, the Catholics will say, Oh, but you Christians, you evangelicals made up the rapture in 1852, Margaret McDonald. And I'll say, no, no, because I've got it in the Bible yeah. that was written, you know, 4,000 years ago. So I can go all the way back to the book of Isaiah mm -hmm. to give you rapture verses. And that was written, you know, 2,500 years ago, 2,600 years ago. Whereas the Catholic Church comes up with their idea of purgatory, which didn't actually predate the Dark Ages, you know, that didn't come about until you got into like the Middle Ages when the kings were in bed with the Pope and the Pope was decided who could be the King of England, who's going to be the King of France, who's going to be the King of Scotland. <clears throat> they decided as sort of a adjunct to their sort of Catholic, which means universal, religious authority that they would also be able to control the hearts and minds of the people in the same way a king would without having to have the most powerful military in the world by dictating to the people, unless you believe as I do, you can't go to heaven. I have the key to heaven because I am like the uh, successor to St. Peter and I have the keys of heaven in my hand. And so they created a doctrine of purgatory sort of as a way of uh, helping generate income for the Catholic Church. You know, it's a form of taxation. If you pay your, you know, what we would in, in Protestant churches and in evangelical churches called tithing, they would say you have to pay indulgences. Like you commit adultery, you got to pay this amount of money. And, it, you know, to get a plenary indulgence, meaning it's all taken care of, you pay a little bit more, you can get a plenary indulgence, and then you can get 
by group rates for sin, you could do like adultery, homosexuality, bestiality, and like uh, murder. You could pay, you know, one big price and you could get a basket of indulgences at once. It would cost you a little bit more, but it ended up saving you money over time because you'd be paying for more than one sin at a time. And when you paid the indulgence, your time in purgatory, paying back your sin debt will be reduced. So everybody, oh, that'd be cool if I pay enough indulgences to the Catholic Church then my time in purgatory will be shortened from maybe six to ten years to maybe six to ten months. And that isn't that a bargain. So yes, <laughs> indulgences were created, you know, uh, you know, during the dark ages and uh, you know, towards the tail end of it, I believe. They didn't exist prior to the dark ages, the middle ages, you know, then I I I, I thought maybe the apocrypha books were added by the Catholic Church to the Catholic There, there are some, uh, and, and that's another reason why the Apocrypha, that collection of books that that um, commonly were known probably in the 15 or 1600s, but were never included in the canon of scripture that goes from Genesis to Revelation. There are a couple of passages there where prayer for the dead is promoted, and prayer for the dead is thought to shorten a person's time in purgatory, which is why you would pray for them. You have a church, you have a uh, what they call Kadesh, uh, you know, the prayer for the dead. You go to the Catholic temple, and, you know, I was at St. Patrick's Cathedral a couple weeks ago when I was up in New York City. Big, beautiful, incredible yeah. church, you know, and all that. And during the day, you can go in there and you can, you know, participate in Kadesh, which is uh, prayer for the dead. Why would you be praying for the dead? Well, if you, you know, you uh, combine your prayer with a Donation to the Catholic Church, it will shorten the time of your loved one in purgatory. So the idea is that your loved one died and went into purgatory, and you know, paying indulgences and praying for them even after they died will help you. So the apocryphal books is another reason why it's an abomination and, and, and apostasy and heresy, and so it shouldn't be included in the Christian uh, canon. Now the uh, Mormon Church, I believe, also they they. Uh, We'll misquote a verse from the King James Version of the Bible. I talked about prayer for the dead or whatever. Said, hey, see, the Mormon Church prays for the dead. So the Mormon Church believes in praying for dead people and baptizing them. The Catholic Church, I don't think they do baptisms for the dead, but the Mormon Church actually will allow you to baptize people that have already died oh. to get them out of what is the equivalent of purgatory and get them into the Mormon heaven. So how about that? Now, that, that there's a plus. People, as Dave Hunt said, will wind up in heaven. I don't know how they got there. It's like, you know, I, I was an atheist my whole life. I don't know what's wrong with our life. And there's the pearly gate of Jesus and the heartbeat of Michael. How did I get up here? Well, dude, after you died, they start paying indulgences and you got baptized at the Mormon tabernacle in Utah. And uh, you didn't know because you were in, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses sleep state. So you were unconscious, but you ended up getting baptized by the Mormons while you were in Jehovah's Witnesses sleep state, mm -hmm. and indulgences got paid to the Pope in Rome, uh, and, and that, that all worked together. Mary went and got your body out of sleep state and wound wow. you up in heaven. There you go. And these are all pseudo-Christian heresies and myths <clears throat> that are not supported by Scripture. However, the rapture is biblical. It is biblical, and so the idea, whenever somebody throws them, like, oh, that's the dates to 1852 and Margaret McDonald and uh, John Nelson Darby. Doesn't make any difference to me what Margaret McDonald or John Nelson Darby believed. I wasn't around in 1852. I can't say I wasn't sitting there in church with Margaret McDonald when she was in some kind of an ecstatic fit. You know, she had some kind of occultic powers. And, you know, she was like some teenage Scottish witch who went to a Protestant church, some Presbyterian church in Scotland. And John Nelson Darby, who was doing his little missionary trip from London, went through Scotland supposedly came to a church service and in a ecstatic fit, she had some kind of a, um, a premonition or word of, from God that there's this new thing called the rapture. Jesus is gonna come for the church in the rapture. And John Nelson Darby heard and said, oh wow, this is a new doctrine. And went back to London and then he, he became a sort of a missionary to the United States of America. 
and came over here and supposedly brought with him from a teenage witch in Scotland the idea of the doctrine of the rapture. But we can put that belief to the lie clearly by referring to John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, where Jesus talks about him going to the Father's house to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself so that where I am there may be also. And it's clearly talking about his Father's house, many mansions in heaven where he will come to us and take us to him. And so then John, uh, excuse me, Paul, clarifies that even more in 1 Thessalonians when he writes his first letter to the Thessalonian church when he says that we'll be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, not in the rally, not at a church rally, not at the Mount of Olives, not anywhere in Jerusalem or Bethlehem, but in, in the clouds. That's a supernatural metaphysical event where dead bodies in Christ and living bodies in Christ are going to be snatched into the air and be Jesus in the air, and then we're going to go all the way back to the Father's house in heaven which we can't get to in the space shuttle. So, again, that's all supernatural stuff that clearly is talked about in the Bible and even Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 26, verses 19 through 26, it might be, where it talks about the Lord comes from out of his place to judge the earth for their wickedness. And he says, come, my people, gather yourselves into your chambers, hide yourself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. For the Lord cometh from out of his place to judge the inhabitants of the earth. Now that, my friend, is why the rapture must occur. So that God will remove the bride of his son, the church, so that he can get the smackdown on the planet earth that has now acknowledged the new king over the people of the planet earth. And that new king is the subject of our next series. An individual, a shadowy figure that the Bible refers to as the Antichrist. So, with that, we're going to segue right on into our, our teaching. And uh, let's start out, since we were talking about John, John, the same guy that gave us John chapter 14, a few chapters ahead of, ahead of time, nine chapters before that, John gave us an interesting reference that a lot of people miss when they're doing a teaching on the Antichrist. They kind of miss, miss out on John's laying down. Um, a hidden reference to this future ruler who is the man who should not be king. John chapter uh, 5, uh, Peter, verse uh, 43, if you would. You can lay down for us. And uh, we have Jesus talking, as, as oftentimes he did to the disciples or to the followers. And, you know, he kind of he kind of is, is, is having a little bit of a debate with some of the religious leaders of the time. And he says so many powerful things here in John chapter 5. You know, and he's, he's, he's refuting the doctrine of the Jehovah's Witnesses in verse 39, where he says, You search the scriptures, religious folks, for in them you think you have eternal life. But these are they which testify of me, yet you are not willing to come to me that you may have eternal life. Verses 39 and 40 of John chapter 5 could be written by Jesus directly to the Jehovah's Witnesses because certainly they spend time and power and money and effort in studying the scriptures. They've got a, a study series called Search the Scriptures, you know, and Studies in the Scriptures, written by Charles Case Russell, except they won't search the, the real scriptures of God. And even if they did, when they were reading the King James Version of the Bible, they rejected Jesus as Jehovah, and they relegated him to a lesser position of authority, the same way the Muslims have done, the same way the Hindus have done, the same way the New Agers have done. Jesus is in the pantheon of good guys, but he's not God. He certainly isn't the almighty God. But Jesus here is refuting the Pharisees by saying, look, you guys spend a lot of time searching the scriptures uh, because you think by doing that you can find eternal life. But these scriptures that you're searching are they which testify of me. But you're not willing to come to me that you may have eternal life. Jesus could say exactly the same thing to Jehovah's Witnesses. Couldn't he, couldn't he say that? You guys are studying your little New World Translation of the Bible, and you search the scriptures because you think that in the scriptures you have eternal life, and the eternal life is in the scriptures, but you don't have it. Why? Because you're not willing to come to me that you might have eternal life. So Jehovah's Witnesses insist upon relegating Jesus to second-class citizenship by referring to him as the Archangel Michael, who disguises himself as a human being for 32 some odd years in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, who when he was crucified, 
never rose from the dead physically. I don't know if people know that, but Jehovah's Witnesses, he said Jesus was dead forever dead, is what Charles David Russell wrote specifically in that. He never rose from the dead physically, he rose spiritually and became the, the sort of uh, Michael the angel, became Michael the angel on steroids and became you know, promoted to the archangel position. He used to be just a regular angel. And then when he rose from the dead spiritually, he became the archangel. But Jesus never rose from the dead. The body of Jesus is in the ground, decaying, dead, forever dead, according to Job's witness. But a little bit further on in John chapter 5, Jesus makes another reference. And this one is even more mysterious and shadowy and is oftentimes overlooked by Bible prophecy scholars in verse 43. I come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. So Jesus threw in a little prophecy for free. No additional charge as he's refuting the heresy of the Pharisees. See what I did there? <laughs> <laughs> sure. um, which, which is applicable to this very day to our modern day Pharisees, the Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, when he says, <clears throat> I've come in my Father's name, mm, but you won't receive me. And Jehovah's Witnesses, just like the Pharisees, would not receive Jesus as God in human flesh or the Son of God. Or, no, the Holy is God, but you're not. No, you're just the archangel. That's all you are. And so Jesus kind of throws us in at the tail end of that, that verse. He says, yet if another comes in his own name, him you will receive. He's talking to the Pharisees as the titular head of the Jewish nation. And he's prophesying that there is going to come a period of time after the church age is over, after I'm raised from the dead, when there will be a new king who will come forward and declare himself to be God, and him you will receive. Jesus is in verse 43 here, making a prophetic reference to the terrible, tragic mistake of the nation Israel that will occur <clears throat> during the 70th week of Daniel. In this 70 week period, 78th week period, which is a seven year period of time, when this entity that Daniel refers to as the little horn is going to rise up. He's going to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem that gets torn down, you know, 40 years after Jesus was crucified. This third temple is going to be rebuilt, and he is going to, at some point in time during that first half of the tribulation period, enter into the temple where he allows the sacrifice to be resumed, and he eventually will sit on the mercy seat and declare himself to be God. You know, he will be accepted initially by the Jewish people because he allowed Israel to rebuild their temple and to resume temple sacrifice. So they're going to say, this man must be the Messiah because he rebuilt our temple and he resumed our temple sacrifices. And no leader has done that. We haven't had a temple since 70 AD, so at this point... About 2,000 years have gone by since they've been able to resume the temple sacrifices. So that benevolent act on the part of the Antichrist is going to trick the Jewish people into believing that he is the long ago prophesied Messiah that they've all been looking for. And so Jesus, looking down through the corridor of time, is kind of telling the Pharisees in advance, yeah, I'm coming, you know, my father's name and you won't receive me. But another is going to come in his own name. Him, you will receive. And they're like, what are you talking about? I have no idea what you're talking about. And you will see. And they will. And that time is almost upon us. So, John chapter 5, verse 43, a mysterious reference, a pre-prophetic reference to this entity, this shadowy figure that John refers to later as the Antichrist. And speaking of John, who wrote the Gospel of John, he also wrote three letters uh, to uh, the church that was established after Jesus rose from the dead, after Jesus ascended to the Father. John went on to write the Gospel of John in about 60 some odd AD. And after that, he wrote, of course, um, three letters, John chapter 1, or John, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, and then he concluded his, his writings of Scripture with the, uh, the, of course, the legendary book of Revelation. So John was the third most prolific 
contributor to the New Testament uh, after, I would say, uh, Paul and uh, Peter, who, who wrote a bunch of stuff as well. So I actually uh, maybe wrote the second most material. But in John, the first epistle that he wrote to the church, he makes a comment in the first letter he wrote to the church, and in John, 1 John chapter 2, in verse 18, he makes reference to this shadowy figure that we now have come to know uh, is this legendary title that, that is the one that sticks. This guy gets a lot of different titles in, in the Bible, but the one that has, has stuck is the one John gave him for the first time in 1 John uh, chapter 2, verse 18. Ingrid, since you didn't have much to read, go ahead and read, read that for us. Little children, it is the last it is the last time and as ye have heard that antichrist shall come even now are there many antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time so john is writing to the church and i believe this this is a man written uh i gotta check the date on it but uh, 90 AD approximately yeah was, I'm sorry approximately 90 AD. Yep, so that would, that would place it a little bit before Revelation, but I was wondering if this was written shortly after he got out of his imprisonment on, uh, on the island of Patmos. So, um, hmm, I've got, a, I've got maybe a 95, 96 day. I think that this probably was written after Revelation was, because basically he's in the final stages of life and he's looking at in the church as sort of children. He's sort of the grandfatherly John. He's the last of the apostles. All the others are dead now. They all have been killed. He was supernaturally kept alive so that he could complete the book of Revelation. And he sort of writes this sort of almost paternalistic little letter. He says, little children, you know, the followers of Christ, he says, you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come, but which we know is the last hour. In other words, he's saying, when you see false Christ coming, you know that we are at the end. And, and John had heard that originally from Jesus himself in Matthew 24, which we looked at a few weeks ago, which we will get to. We won't get to it today. But as we're going through this series on the Antichrist, there's so much material on him scattered throughout the Bible because it's so very critical that we understand who this guy is. Jesus had made reference to this abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet in Matthew 24, the of Discord. The abomination of desolation is what act that we just kind of made reference to. Antichrist goes in the of God and claims himself to be God. Yep. And, and our friend Paul wrote specifically about that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This abomination of desolation is what Jesus called it. Paul writes about it in detail. John is making reference to it here in his first epistle to the church. He says, uh, you know, we already know it's the last hour because you know, a lot of false prophets have arisen, and we see false prophets coming, false Christ coming, you know that we're at the last time. And so now, when we fast forward 2,000 years after John wrote that, can we think of anyone who has come forth claiming to be Christ and turned out not to be Jesus? Like who? Can you name some names? Uh, well, David Koresh. Say that, Steve? David Koresh. David Koresh was a perfect example. You guys remember him? From uh, Waco, Texas, yeah. when he had the uh, the religious compound in Waco, Texas, mm -hmm. and he eventually wrote like this long letter and had it read on CNN or whatever, where he, he eventually revealed to the world that he was Jesus mm -hmm. back from the dead, and you know he had taken over the compound and that the government, if they would just kindly withdraw their tanks and troops, everything would be okay, be fun, and he would bring the the end of times down upon the world and so on and so forth. And uh, the well, ATF, I think, was the lead bureau at that time. They they took issue with his interpretation of scripture and firebombed the whole place and killed everybody. So Koresh died in a hail of gunfire and flame of dishonor as the government blew him up. Um, and uh, it turned out that that he wasn't he wasn't Jesus because he he got killed by the ATF. Now we have another. Uh, he really said. Uh, Jim Jones, and Jim Jones, was he set up his shop where? Where was he based? Guyana. Guyana. Guyana, South America. Yes, that's right. 
He had started out, I think, as a government operative in, you know, the mind control programs that, that were, you know, up and running by the time we got to the end of World War II that became a little a little more involved. And I think there's a, there a great deal of research on mind control operations. And there's some suggestion in the literature out there that, uh, that this guy, Jim Jones, was actually an agent uh, of the state working uh, to play out a PSYOP to see how well this type of project would work on unsuspecting citizens. And we do know that, you know, this kind of thing happened clearly. We, World War II, we saw who, who, who was doing it, you know, in, in, in World War II. Hitler. Hitler was doing all kinds of crazy experiments on the Jews who were already earmarked for death in the concentration camp. So what's a little experimentation going to do? You know, keep some out of the ovens, you know, for a little while longer. And so they took kids who were identical twins and they did all kinds of horrific operations and experiments on them without, you know, uh, as you were talking about then, uh, you know, Novocaine or some type of uh, uh, anesthesia. And so they did these, these horrific genetic operations, but they also did operations related to mind control. And, you know, unfortunately, they made some progress in a project that they had, that they referred to, you know, by the German rubric, uh, the mind control operation that they had, gained, uh, apparently, some secrets as to how the human mind could be manipulated with the idea being not just to torture people just because they were evil, they were, and, and some of those people were, were clearly Satanists, but they wanted to, to create what? What were they looking to create by using the mind control? Mind controlled person. A super soldier, you know, a perfect human robot. So that you are program. Worse. Say again? Aryan. Uh, Aryan race. Well, no, I, I would say the Aryan race is a whole different subset of sort of the German mythology is that the Aryans were descended, and I think that there's some truth to that particular mythology, that they were descended from these godmen that came down from the sky that had blonde hair, blue eyes. And that may relate to what we're going to look at a little bit later, the Nephilim, when the, the, the fallen angels came down in the form of men who were apparently incredibly glorious to look upon. And so people would suggest that these Nephilim or these fallen angels that, that sired this race of supermen who were blonde haired, blue eyed, you know, sort of godlike, Greek god looking individuals who took wives, had children, and so on and so forth. And because of that mythology, the Teutonic mythology of the Aryan race, the idea was that these starmen came down from the skies and landed on the Caucasus Mountains. And that's where we get the word Caucasian, which is used to make reference to people who are not. You know, black or not Asian or not some other ethnic group. Uh, you can use the fair skinned individual called Caucasians because it's believed that they sort of were indigenous to this mountain range called the Caucasus Mountains. But the mythology attached to that is that the star men came down to the Caucasus Mountains and picked out wives and impregnated them and created a race of supermen that had blonde hair, blue eyes. And these were the so called Aryans. But that's not what the Nazis were doing in the concentration camps, because clearly the Jews were not considered to be Aryans. So that's why they were chosen for experimentation. But what they were trying to do is to learn the secrets of the human mind that was created by God himself. And they were trying to deconstruct it so that they could learn how to manipulate it for their own purposes so they could make a human robot that they could program to do whatever they wanted. And they were able to make strides with that. And a funny thing happened on the way to Adolf you know, Hitler, you know, taking over the world, it was Hitler lost. Oh, so as the Nazis lost World War II, it turned out that these secrets that the Nazi scientists had committed to writing and research or whatever began to fall in the hands of some of the Russian soldiers who were coming in to do battle and to take over. And, Russians got, got to Germany first and then the United, United States of America, they were they were coming in as well and they were going in and shutting down some of the concentration camps. So some of the Russians were some of the first people to get to the concentration camps and shut down places like Auschwitz and the like. And they found out, like, hey, 
what's this stuff? You know, they got mind control stuff. The Nazis know how they, they had some of the brightest scientists because the they short answer is what? Yeah. yeah. They, they, were, they were Satanists. Right. Yeah. They were cheating. Yeah. They, were, they didn't study hard and get better grades in school than we did. It's that they were in league with Satan, just like we see the Mayans and the Incans yeah. went from being savages in the jungle, eating baby blood or whatever, to building the most fantastic mathematical calendars in all of world history and then being able to build pyramids that were specifically and perfectly aligned to the stars and they knew things about astrology and astronomy that no one had ever known. How did they get all that information? By making a deal with the devil in exchange for occultic or hidden information to give them the most advanced race in the area so they can run the world. And Satan used that same ploy in the Garden of Eden with Eve. Wouldn't you like to be a goddess? Go ahead. Oh, so we the Egyptians. Uh, the Egyptians, I would say the Egyptians learned how to build the pyramids as well. If they, in fact, built the pyramids. So some questions and debate <laughs> as to who actually built the pyramids in Egypt. And I've been there, I've been inside them and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I don't think that I've, I've gotten a satisfactory answer as to who built them. But whoever did build them uh, had supernatural occultic knowledge because the stones of those pyramids, particularly the ones in Egypt, are so large, like the building block stones that the Cheops pyramid is built with, is made of stones that go from about one end of this apartment maybe to the bedroom wall. And like, I mean, they're massively, massively huge building blocks cut out of like granite. But they are so finely fitted together that you couldn't take a sheet of paper and slide it between the two stones. So if you, you take a, you know, a cube the size of an apartment and set it next to another cube made of stone the size of an apartment, you would think you'd be able to stick your arm between yeah, it. You know, because, you, know, this, you, know, you would have had to have had like some kind of a laser operated stone cutter to be able to make a cut that precise that you can't slide paper between. So the idea is that, you know, certainly at that time, you know, the pyramids have been around for at least 2,500 years, and some people think the, the pyramids predate the flood. So that would be 4,500 years. The pyramids may be 5,000 years old. So how on earth did the stonemasons of the, they certainly, and I went there, and I watched the stonemasons sitting out in the sand with a chisel and a mallet going, do, 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 hitting on stones. And let me tell you, they could make little, little, they were making little pyramid things in the sand and you could buy them and stuff. They couldn't make a pyramid like that with those little chisels and, you know, hammer that they had. They had supernatural help to build those pyramids. And that's exactly what the Mayans and Incans did. And so, what we find out then is that the Nazis in Germany, they were in league also with the powers of the occult to be able to hopefully, Hitler believed, uh, establish the, uh, the, you know, the Third Reich, which would be uh, sort of an imitation of what he had read about in the Bible as being this thousand year reign of Jesus on the earth, only he was gonna be the guy that's reigning on the earth for a thousand years. So he called it the Third Reich, the, you know, the, the, the thousand year reign for the third millennium, and he was gonna be the guy in charge of it. And so when he failed, some of his scientists who had already opened the door of the occult to gain advanced knowledge in rocketry and some of the, uh, that's where we get the idea, you know, rocket scientists, you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that, you know, Michigan's gonna beat, you know, North Dakota State Tech uh, next week. And that's, that's kind of where you get the idea that the rocket scientists are the smartest people in the world. They weren't really necessarily the smartest people in the world. They had occultic information because they, were in league with Satan. And they did the same thing with their mind control experiments. And as a result, the individuals who were in charge of the intelligence agency in the United States, which at the time was called what? OSS. The OSS, which is the Office of Strategic Services, um, which is now known as CIA. There you go. Mm -hmm. Those guys thought, you know what, as Nazi Germany falls, this information about mind control might fall into the hands of the only other guys that were liberating Germany were who? The Russians and Russians. The Soviets, right? You know, the Russians, you know, that was a bad thing back in that day. You know, the Soviet Union, remember those guys? It was a conglomeration of uh, 
Soviet states, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, like 20 nations united together around Russia to take over the world. And so the idea or the decision was made to bring the Nazi scientists with their advanced occultic research on mind control and rocketry, by the way, um, uh, to the United States. And they did it under a program called oh, Mind Control. Well, nope. Uh, it was a program that was called uh, uh, Operation Paperclip, actually. Paperclip because when they, when they were being sort of illegally imported or immigrated into the United States, these secret service agencies, the OSS and the CIA, would give them new identities and they would paperclip them to a board and say, okay, you're no longer Joseph Mingley, you're... Uh, Joseph Dr. Gerhard, yeah. and you're going to be sent to Stanford University to be professor of neuropsychology, and you're going to be uh, Reinhard Galen, and you're going to the University of Michigan, and you're going to, you know, specialize in neurological engineering. And you know, they took these guys, they took them out of the concentration camps, and sent them to the major research universities in the United States: uh, Harvard, Yale, uh, University of Pennsylvania, Stanford, Michigan, and the University of Chicago in the Midwest. UCLA, Stanford on the West Coast, and they sort of replanted them, gave them new identities under Operation Paperclip. And one of the projects that was believed to have been brought with them was a program called MK Ultra, which was sort of a uh, sort of an acronym for the German program called Mind Control Ultra, which was how to build a human robot. And so we have that brought in. How I got onto this, but it kind of it kind of ties in. And so we find out that that kind of uh, thing sort of made its way out of Nazi Germany into the United States of America under the idea that, hey, if you want to get ahead and be the biggest guy in the world, you need the occultic knowledge, which is exactly the same gambit that Satan used with Eve in the Garden of Eden, which resulted in the fall of the human race. And then he did it again later with Nimrod, you know, unite all the people together, we're going to build a tower up into the heavens so that the fallen ones, these star men, can interact with us and tell us how to build the best civilization ever, and we'll be able to rule the world. And then when God scattered the nations and spread them all over the world, he again decided to go to different people groups and say, like, listen, if you do this, if you do that, then I'll give you information to help make you guys the best group of folks in South America. And you got the Mayans and the Incans and you know, those guys compete with one another to see who could do more human blood sacrifices to build the best pyramids and the best ziggurats and have the best calendars so that they could be the one, you know, world government in South America. While at the same time, on the other side of the globe, they're doing the same thing in Egypt and the same thing is going on in Babylon and Syria. And, and, and basically that's how Satan plays the game. The game is, is, I'll give you information that you can't obtain in yourself on your own and you'll be able to dominate and conquer all of your neighbors, and you can rule the world, and I'll rule alongside you. And so that's the idea behind this entity that John is referring to in 1 John chapter 2 as the Antichrist. And, and you know, he's saying, we already know that the spirit of Antichrist is in the world because individuals have risen up who have claimed to be this Antichrist person. So, so you know, we, we did a little primer on Nazi Germany and MK Ultra and, and, and all that, to, just to show that even in a place like the United States of America, which is a godly country where Christians, it was supposed to be a Christian country and all that, even we fell prey, you know, or certain individuals in our government fell prey to the desire to, we want to be the biggest, the best, and the brightest, or you, you could argue, we don't want the Soviets to be smarter and, and build the human robots and be able to take over the world with the super soldiers. So we better get these, these bad guys, these Nazis, who would have otherwise gone to Nuremberg, stood trial, and been hung, which is what most of them wound up doing. But some of the really, really good ones came here, the United States, and were given alternate identities. And so as a result, we have sort of built into our own country, you know, the seeds of satanic wrath, you know, that God has not yet judged, because some of those guys got away with murder in, in Nazi Germany, and some of them got away here, some of them got away to South America. And so, 
you know, that final page hasn't been turned yet. And so there you go. When, you know, when, you, when you're debating issues, whether the United States is a Christian country or not, you ask yourselves, is it a christ like thing to do to allow the ones who tortured and killed six million of the Lord's brethren to have a way to escape justice because they were smarter than some of the other guys at Harvard or Yale? And so that's, a, that's an answer you guys are going to have to make. But again, 1 John chapter 2 makes reference to this guy, the Antichrist, that is coming. Now, John is at the end of his earthly ministry. He's already, you know, seen all the prophecies of the book of Revelation. He's laid them all out. And now he's kind of telling the church again in, in, in one of his last missives to this church. He's referring to them like the way grandfather might refer to his young grandkids, or little children. You know, you've heard. You've read the book of Revelation. Antichrist is coming. And already... Uh, there are other antichrists, or those who would be antichrists have come, and, and by, by that we know it's the last hour. So stay alert and ready. And so then, Ingrid, finally, uh, 1 John uh, chapter uh, 4, verse 3. And every spirit that confesses, confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof we have heard that it, sh that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. So we know that John is telling him a little bit later, he said, Yeah, remember you heard that Antichrist was coming, and the spirit of Antichrist is already in the world. And he says, you know, again, refuting you know, the Gnostic heretics that said that Jesus, when he came to earth, only appeared to be a man, but he was really a spirit, you know, he looked like a man, he didn't really come in human flesh, and then Jehovah's Witnesses kind of twisted a little bit. They say that Jesus came as a man, but he didn't rise from the dead as a man, he rose from the dead as a spirit. Again, sort of a, sort of a modification of the Gnostic heresy, and, and John lays out that. He says, every spirit that does not confess Jesus came in the flesh, is not of God, and this is the spirit of the Antichrist, or the spirit that is the one who is against Christ, or the one who will replace Christ, where we have heard that it should come, and even now, that spirit is already in the world, as of 96 AD, that spirit was already in the world in the form of Gnosticism, which at the time was considered to be sort of a sort of aberrant form of biblical Christianity at the time, the Gnostics, so we're Christians too, you guys can't, you know, capitalize on the name Christian. We can call ourselves Christians if we want to, and they did. Just like Joel Lewis has called himself Christian. Just like Mormons call themselves Christians. Just like, you know, Seth Day Dennis called themselves Christian, but are not, you know. So we find, we, we, we find those things as well. So now, we'll roll that back into the Old Testament, and in the Old Testament, we find out that, again, the Antichrist is made reference to not directly by that title, Antichrist, but this entity, who again goes by various different names, is spoken of by Zechariah the prophet. Now, Zechariah wrote about a number of things related to the last days in his 14 chapter book, which is the second, I think, second to the last, you know, book of the Old Testament, and right before Malachi the prophet. And Zechariah said a lot of things about the second coming of the Lord. He said he, he saw the battle of Armageddon, and he wrote about that. He wrote about the day of the Lord, the vengeance of the Lord. And that's, again, why the, the rapture must occur first, because the wrath of God is coming down on the world to punish this shadowy figure called the Antichrist for taking over the temple in Jerusalem and declaring himself to be God. And that's going to be a bridge too far for the Lord. He's going to be like, oh, no, 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 no. You know, I've turned the other cheek too many times. And I've held my wrath, but now you've gone too far. And Satan himself, and we're going to find out that the power behind this Antichrist is more than just, you know, some malevolent, you know, shadowy fellows in a conference room in New York City smoking cigars, planning on taking over the world through economic entry, but it's rather Satan himself that will be empowering and using the body of the Antichrist as an avatar so that he can walk and talk and interact just in the same way Jesus was God 
And the Bible says, God is spirit, and he who worships him must be worshiped in spirit and truth. But then, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, this brand new thing happened that had never happened before. God was manifest in human flesh and could walk and talk amongst the creation, us, the sons of Adam, the children of men, could interact with God face to face, touch him, sit down, have lunch with him, hug him, you know, do all types of things. The same thing we could do with each other, we could do with God directly. He had made himself finite and small enough that we, finite small creatures, could interact and touch him and understand him and love him and be loved and, and engage in, in different things that, that you know, beings do. And so we find that Satan is going to counterfeit that very same miracle, but he's going to do it in the person of the Antichrist so that Satan will be able to walk and talk and interact amongst us. He won't just be a spirit anymore that is out there in the ether or in another dimension that may be right in front of us, but we can't see him because God shut down the satellite dish in our forehead called, you know, the you know, pineal gland or whatever, and so we can't see him in the spirit world anymore. But when Antichrist comes, all of the safeguards that God put in place to prevent the children of men from interacting with the fallen angels of B'nai HaElohim who followed after Lucifer, those safeguards will be removed once the church is no longer in the way. And Satan will be able to interact with the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve, the children of men, face to face, just like he was able to do it when he was in the Garden of Eden with Lucifer disastrous effect when he went up to Eve. He was able to walk up to her and have a conversation with her. And she was able to see him and talk to him and interact back to him. And God stopped all of that because of what happened as a result of that. But during the 70th week of Daniel, during this tribulation period, all of those rules will now be suspended. The church age will be over. That's another reason why the church has got to be taken out of the world. As long as we are here, Satan cannot manifest himself in human flesh and interact with the people because he would meet with an impenetrable bulwark in the form of the church. And Steve would walk up to Satan and be able to, I rebuke you in the name of the Lord, you know, resist the devil and he will flee. You gotta flee. And so he'd be running around from street corner to street corner every time an evangelical Christian would open up a big black King James Bible. He would refute the devil in the name of Jesus and Satan would be bound by law. To flee, he'd never get anything done. So the church has got to be taken out of the way. And the only way to take the church out of the way so Satan can have his moment, his last seven-year period of time, is for the rapture to occur to remove the body of Christ out of the world. Now, the saints that believe on the Lord after the rapture, we found out, are referred to by the title, the tribulation, the tribulation saints, which is not making reference to the church. But we find out the tribulation saint differs from the church in that when the Antichrist makes war against the tribulation saints, he, will prevail. <laughs> he prevails against them. So Satan is no longer required to run and flee from the tribulation saints because they don't have the power that we had through the Holy Spirit, through the blood of Jesus, indwelling in us. Now that dispensation of time called the church age mm -hmm. is over. You see why? The father isn't going to leave his son's bride in a world where we no longer have power to withstand the wiles of the devil. Satan would make, he, he, the first target would be the church. Like, I'm going to, you guys tormented me for 2,000 years. I had to flee and suffer defeat at your hands. And now you've been stripped of your power. You've been abandoned by the father. You are mine. I'm going to tear you to shreds. Mm -hmm. It would be the church. It would be a bloodbath. It would be far worse than any Holocaust ever. But Jesus isn't going to allow that to happen to his bride. He says to the Father, I'm going to get my bride. Yeah, it is. We're going to be married together. I'm not going to allow them to fall into the hands of Satan because you stripped them of their authority. And then they're going to be collateral damage when you bring judgment down upon the earth. No, they have to be taken off first. So we're going to go home first at the rapture. And then this final seven-year drama is going to play itself out where Antichrist will be Satan and human flesh interacting amongst the people just like he did in the Garden of Eden, just like Jesus did during his three-year earthly ministry prior to his crucifixion and uh, resurrection. So 
Zechariah. Let's see what Zechariah had to say, you know, in in prophetic language. He he does this really interesting thing in, in the book of Zechariah, a very fascinating book. And in the eleventh chapter, he lays out an image or a picture that, that God, the Holy Spirit, paints for him of various types of shepherds. One being a prototype of Jesus and how this good shepherd will come to the people and be rejected and therefore the covenant will be broken. The covenant between God and the nation Israel is broken when Israel rejects the good shepherd and the good shepherd is no longer amongst the people anymore. And as judgment, God will send them, just like it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, God will send them strong delusion that they will believe the lie so that they can be damned. And that lie is that UFOs took the church and I, the Antichrist, am God. And that's God's judgment on a world of Gentiles that have rejected Christ. And God did the same thing. And he's talking about the same thing in the book of Zechariah where he says because the nation Israel rejected Jesus, rejected him as their Messiah, he's going to allow a false shepherd referred to as either the worthless shepherd or the idle shepherd, meaning the shepherd that allows himself to be worshipped like, you know, a statue you buy down and worship before as a god, but he's not really a god, he's just a statue. So, Zechariah, we're going to look at verses 16 and 7 of, of 11, Phil, you can go ahead and read that for us. We see that there is a punishment that God imposes upon the nation of Israel for rejecting the true Messiah, Jesus, and he allows to come on the scene a false Messiah who is this individual that John refers to as the Antichrist. So here we are, Zechariah 500 years before Jesus. We see Zechariah chapter 11, uh, verses 16 and 17. For lo, I will raise up a shepherd in the land which shall not be the door that be cut off. Neither shall see the young one, nor hear that it, that that is broken. No fear that that standeth still, but he shall eat the flesh of the fowl, and tear the claw in pieces. Who to the hero shepherd that live the flock, the sword shall be upon his arm, and upon his right eye his arm shall be clean dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. Okay, so we see that towards the tail end of chapter 11, uh, you know, God is telling uh, Zechariah to sort of dress up and, and sort of act out this, this, this drama so that the people will understand what you're doing. He says, okay, now, after you've acted out the, the Messiah, and, and, he, and it's interesting because he lays it out in verse 10, he makes reference to the real Messiah. And in verse 12, he says, then... I said to them, if it is agreeable to you, give me my wage, and if not, refrain. So they weighed out my wages, 30 pieces of silver. Weighed out for my wages, 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, the pricely price that they set upon it. Now what are they referring to there? What's that making reference to? What's it? Judah, what he received, um, the money that Judah received when he betrayed Jesus. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a five centuries early prophetic reference to Jesus being sold, basically, for 30 pieces of silver. Parenthetically, the 30 pieces of silver was the price that you would pay if your slave got gored by your neighbor's, uh, you know, bull. Like, oh, you know, Joe's slave got gored and he can't work for two days. Uh, here, 30 pieces of silver. That's the price you, you paid when, when, when you made somebody slave sick for a couple. And so Jesus was paid the price of an injured slave. And sarcastically he says, you know, a goodly price to that. I was prized at. And then he says, the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, the princely price that they set upon me. And so I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them to the house of the Lord for the potter. And that's exactly what Judas did, right? 
Remember after he struck his deal with, you know, the the individuals that that he betrayed Jesus for, and then he took that thirty pieces of silver, and remember he felt guilty about it, and he came back and he threw it on the floor, uh, you know, of the Sanhedrin, and said, "This is blood money, you know, and I've condemned innocent blood." And then he went out and hung himself, and they were like, "Oh, this money's cursed." And so he said, oh, we'll take the money and we'll buy a potter's field. Meaning, like, poor people that couldn't afford to, to get a burial ground, we'll buy a plot of land and bury anonymous people there. And that's kind of what they did. And so that prophecy was literally fulfilled by uh, Judas uh, some 500 years later. But then, after uh, Zechariah acts out that particular scene, then, you know, God tells Zechariah to, to do the following. He says... Um, okay, verse 15. Now, take up the implements of the foolish shepherd or the worthless shepherd. And, you know, and then he says, okay, now you're going to sort of play out this, this final scene for the people. And in verse 16, it says, For lo, I will raise up a shepherd in the land which shall not visit those that be cut off, neither shall he seek the young one, nor shall he heal that which is broken, nor shall he feed. Uh, that which stands still, but he shall eat the flesh of the fat and tear the claws in pieces. And then he says, woe unto the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The shepherd isn't supposed to leave the flock. The shepherd's supposed to stand guard over the flock and when the beast comes and he fights to the death to protect them. Interestingly enough, he goes on to say of this idle shepherd, which in the New King James Version is called the worthless shepherd, the idle shepherd, or the shepherd that is worshipped as a god that he is not, a false god. Another way of saying idle shepherd is to say the false god shepherd that leaveth the flock. It says, the sword shall be upon his arm, and upon his, his right eye. And his arm shall be clean dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. And there is where we see the Illuminati symbolism that is so prevalent in pop culture today, right? Like, every girl who wants to be a pop star or a model or whatever, at some point in time, you will see her do a photo spread. I don't care whether it's a Glamour magazine or there's Playboy magazine. For whatever magazine they're going to, there's going to be at least one shot, usually many shots, of them either putting their hand over one of their eyes or covering their hair or whatever so that one of their eyes is obscured. There is no supermodel, there is no actress, there is no one who was of any import who was a female in the entertainment industry that does not have at least several photographs of her. Doesn't matter what the photo shoot is about, it could be swimwear, it could be athletic wear, it could be, you know, evening wear, but there's gonna be a shot of her with one eye obscured. Because that is a occultic sigil. It is a signal to those in the know. She is one of ours. She is a slave of the Antichrist system, which is what the entertainment industry is. The one eye symbol, which we see Beyonce doing, and we see Rihanna doing, and we see Katy Perry doing, Christina Aguilera, Britney Spears, everybody that is anybody does it. And then you also see guys like Jay-Z, right? Just Rockefeller records. He take, puts the one eye in, in the form of a triangle. He sticks the one eye in, and the other one he obscures, right? All of that symbolism comes from this verse. And, then on, and, on the and on the back of the dollar bill, what do you see? You see a truncated pyramid. Not a regular pyramid, but a pyramid whose capstone has been removed and is floating in space. And in the area where the capstone on the pyramid should be is a gigantic single eye that is staring out at you, which is the Egyptians referred to as the eye of Horus. Other Semitic occultists referred to it as the eye of Agamotto. That was the name of the comic book store I used to go to when I was a kid on the campus. Really? Yeah. That's where I learned to read all. I got all my occultic <coughs> superheroes who were the Nephilim. That I, I didn't know about the Nephilim, but I knew that I was like worshiping these superhero individuals. I went to a comic book store in the Kansas City University of Michigan, where Aaron Carrollton was also based, by the way, parenthetically. Uh, and it was called the Eye of Akamano. And I was like, Akamano? I was like, 
Who's that? What's with yeah, that? But it was just a big giant eye, and you go in there and you learn all this stuff about all these supernatural characters. Men of renown, it says in Genesis chapter 6. Legendary supermen who became the legends of old. And so the one eye symbol relates. And when you see it, whether you see it on the back of the dollar, I don't have a dollar bill. Let me open my book this week. Do you have one? Let's see what you got on the back. Let's see what we got. It's on, it's on, 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 on the front. So here we have, right here, for those of you in the home viewing audience, we have not the American Eagle, but we have the Phoenix Bird, which is the occultic symbol of chaos and disorder. You destroy the the, the present world order, and as the phoenix rose from the ashes of destruction, a new world order will arise. And you have that phrase uh, right in there. It says, uh, you know, uh, a seclorum, uh, a seclorum, uh, whatever. It was, it was one out of many, out of many one, out of many people comes this one world government. And then you see the, the pyramid here, which I'm now pointing at. It is a pyramid that has a truncated top. And the truncated top, meaning the, the capstone of the pyramid, has been supernaturally removed and it's floating on top of the pyramid itself. Meaning, oh man, it's almost completed, but the capstone hasn't fallen in place yet. And in the middle of the capstone that's floating in place and is about to settle down on top of the pyramid is what? It's a gigantic eye. Not two eyes or a face, but a gigantic eyeball. The eye of Horus. The completion of the New World Order. Uh, and again, you've got the, the Latin or the Annuit Coeptus Novus Ordo Seclorum. That is Latin for announcing the establishment of the New World Order. Ta da! Drum roll, please. And it's got. A gigantic eyeball, which is the eye of Osiris, the eye right. of Horus, and it is the very same symbolism that's taken. Satan takes things out of scripture. Stephen, what would you do? Yeah, no, 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 all of that one-eyed symbolism stuff comes from Zechariah chapter 11. Zechariah chapter 11 is referring to the idle shepherd, the worthless shepherd, whose right eye will be utterly darkened. It is referring to the Antichrist, the symbol on the back of the dollar bill of the United States of America is a symbol of the Antichrist establishing a new World order, Novus Ordo Seclorum, <laughs> Annuit Coeptus, announcing the establishment of the Novus Ordo Seclorum, the new order of the ages, the new world order. That's on the back of the dollar of the United States, it's supposedly a Christian country. No, no, no. It is, it is a symbol or a sigil that those in the know understand that, hey, we control the money. Now, I forgot who said it, was it one of the Rothschilds said, to control the, the money of a country, and I care not who writes its laws, I will control them. If you can control the money of a country, you can control the country itself. And we see that happening now. So it doesn't really matter what you, the people, believe. If we control your banks, if we control, you know, the, the debt, then we can control the court system, we can control the legislature, we can control the executive, we can eventually control the masses through finance. And Satan has used that trick uh, for a long time now. But that, that uh, what they call Illuminati symbolism, all comes from Zechariah chapter 11, verse 17. The one-eyed God, the Antichrist. And in Norse mythology, um, the, the chief god of the Norse pantheon of gods, who are uh, depicted in, in, in the comics as Odin, Odin, who is referred to as the All Father. He is the father of Thor, who is himself a Nephilim. He is the result of Odin having sex with an Earth girl to create the God of Thunder, who is the Superman 
who had blonde hair and blue eyes and a mighty hammer and whatever, but Odin himself, who is referred to as the All-Father, the, the, the chief god of the Norwegian or Scandinavian pantheon of gods that live in the you know, eternal city of Asgard, connected by the Rainbow Bridge, he is the one-eyed god who allegedly in this cataclysmic battle loses one of his eyes and is forever blinded in one eye. And that's depicted in the, the movie that was uh, released by you know, Marvel Studios a couple years back, Thor number two, uh, depicts Odin losing his eye in a battle with the frost giants. You know, how they hit him in the, in the head with a club that had spikes in it and he lost his eye and from then on he was the one-eyed god of Asgard. And Thor part three is actually, I believe, coming out within the next year. And that one will be referred to as Ragnarok. Ragnarok, for those of us who were into Norse mythology because of our love for Marvel comic books and Thor was one of my favorite characters as a kid, Ragnarok is the Scandinavian Armageddon. They are making a movie about the Norse version of the Book of Revelation's final battle, which we call the Battle of Armageddon. The Scandinavian peoples, Swiss, the Swedes, the Norwegians, they all have a mythology of a final battle, which includes the one-eyed god Odin, who is the all-father god of Asgard, and a gigantic serpent who lives in the earth that breaks free in the last days, and this dragon is known in, in the Scandinavian as Fafnir, and he breaks free and destroys all of civilization and brings civilization as we know it to an end. And that is referred to as Ragnarok. And sometimes you'll see like the, the, the cool sort of skater dudes, hippie teens riding around skateboards with a shirt on and they'll say Ragnarok on it. It's like you think it's the name of some new heavy metal rock group. It's really not. It's the name of an ancient Scandinavian uh, final battle for the ages, the equivalent of Armageddon in, in, in the Scandinavian tongues is referred to as Ragnarok, which a gigantic serpent comes free who he's, who's been imprisoned in the earth for centuries, finally breaks free and is able to destroy all life on the earth. It is a shadow, a picture, a type of Satan finally being free from the bowels of the earth, from being imprisoned, from being restrained by God. And he's been in restraint for 6,000 years. He's been allowed to do things, but he hasn't been able to allow to destroy the whole world, has he? Because if he would, he would have done it already. His envy and hatred for the sons of Adam, daughters, leave the children of men, because he was created differently, or we were created differently than him. We were created in the image of God himself, which is something that even the angels were shocked and stunned by. Oh my gosh, what is this new thing? It's called a man. And Satan's rage and hatred for being superseded by an even greater creation than himself has lasted for 6,000 years now, and he has plotted our destruction which is what Armageddon is really all about. He is planning to replace the children of men with his own children. And, right, and Steve, that's right, Steve, Steve said the magic word, the seed of the serpent. And we're gonna, we may have time, actually hit upon that. Can you repeat what you said, Nick? What did you oh, yeah. repeat the, uh, to replace the children of the world with? Only? Children of men. It's okay. the children of the world. Because okay. the world has different connotations. When I think okay. of the world, I think of Satan's running the show. What I said was okay. the children of men, which is kind of a term of art. Yeah. The sons of Adam, daughters of Eve, are the children of men, biogenetic descendants of Adam and Eve. Satan intends, I would submit to you, to replace the biogenetic descendants of Adam and Eve, the children of men, sons mm -hmm. of Adam, daughters of Eve, mm -hmm. with his own children. And I have scriptural support for that theory. Before we get to that, let's take a look at the beginning. Let's roll it all the way back to the beginning. This is the most profoundly dramatic, heart-rending, passage of literature written anywhere in the world, in any civilization, at any time, is Genesis chapter 3. 
There is nothing written by any of the Greek tragic writers, any of the Roman poets, none of the people, whether it be Walt Whitman or any of the great Irish poets, any of the great British and English sonnet writers, Shakespeare, it really wasn't Shakespeare, um, but that's another story, France and yeah. you know, okay. France and the half. Um, none of those guys can write something as poignant, heart-rending as Genesis chapter 3. And so, we will flip over there, and Ben is going to be able to do us honors by reading for us, if you would, Ben, in your best sort of Alexander Scorpion voice, Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 15, and then we will break it down and discuss that, because that is the set piece. It is the linchpin upon which all of Scripture is held together. Everything that happens in Scripture happens because of the first 15 verses of Genesis chapter 3. Without the first 15 verses of Genesis chapter 3, nothing else in the Bible happens. Everything that happens from Genesis to Revelation happens because of verses 1 through 15 of Genesis chapter 3, which Ben has arrived from the mountains of Brazil just in time to deliver to the people. Ben, if you would. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam, unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? He said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded thee, that thou shouldn't, shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And so there we have it. We have laid out the very beginnings of what Dr. Henry Morris referred to as the long war against God. It begins right there in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. When you go back and look, we see that Eve is in the Garden of Eden kind of my own business, just enjoying the beautiful garden that God has built for the man and the woman to enjoy, and they're supposed to tend to it and to sort of uh, keep it, and they were kind of, kind of like gardeners, and 
you know, they can do different things. Oh, let's arrange this step this way. Let's do this, let's do that. And as she was walking around, she was approached by the serpent. And we find out that the serpent was more subtle. Like the old King James was more subtle, subtle. Meaning he's smarter, clever, more wise than any other beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, and by the way, you know, I, I was reading in, in our William McDonald commentary, I know Peter has a copy of it as well. You know, William McDonald says, you know, that so many people try to take the book of Genesis, particularly Genesis chapter 3, and say, oh, come on, it's a talking serpent yeah. talking to a girl. This isn't an allegory. There are allegories in the Bible. You know, and, and William McDonald says, you know, there are allegories in the Bible, but this isn't one. <laughs> and he adds as proof of that, that Paul makes reference to this same exchange. He says, Paul was under the impression that the serpent was literally true. Enough. Peter makes reference to Genesis chapter 3. And he thinks this is literally true. He believes that a serpent is literally talking to Eve. And Jesus, of course, makes reference to Adam and Eve as real, literal people that really did exist. And he was under the impression that all of this was literally true as well. So if Peter, Paul, and Jesus were under the impression, then, again, as Dr. William McDonald says, there are allegories in the Bible, but this isn't one of them. Mm -hmm. And so we find out that this is a literal transaction. And, and, and William McDonald points out, he says, you know, this isn't you know, the only time in Scripture where there is evidence of God using supernaturalism to cause an animal to speak. And I can think of right off the, off the bat, you know, at least one other incident, which is, uh, what, Steve? Balaam. 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 His donkey. Why are you beating me? Why are you doing this to me? And then, he's like, ah! The donkey's talking, right? He freaked out. He's like, oh my God, the donkey's talking. What the freak is this? This wasn't an allegory. This was literally true. Because it was an allegory, an allegory, the person wouldn't be shocked. He would say, well, I'm beating you, donkey, because such and such and so. And then they go and have lunch and they discuss right. important things. No. When the donkey started talking to Balaam, he was like, oh, what, is, what madness is this? And then an angel of the Lord appeared and says, you know, God has sent me to stop you from going into the village. And if you would force the donkey to continue across this line, I would have killed you on the spot and let the donkey live. He just saved your life. And he's like, oh, my goodness, okay, all right, I'm, I'm going back and I'm going to do what God told me to do. And so there is an instance where the animal, a donkey, actually talked mm -hmm. to a man and spared his life. You know, now you're like, well, why are you hitting me? I've been a faithful servant all my life and I've never done anything wrong. Look, why are you hitting me? You know, it's not anything with that. And I think there's, gosh, there's got to be at least one other. Well, big on uh, Patmos when he, the devil was in him, uh, or well, come too soon. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Let's see. So he he the says demon spoke with him from the pig. Didn't take it with the demon. No, the the demon spoke from the man, and then they went into the pigs. But okay. Oh wait, but when he went into the pig, oh yeah, he's asking. No, he was, he was talking to the man. Right. And the man was demon possessed, and he says. What is your name? He says, my name is Legion, for we are many. Yes. And he says, he let us go into the pigs. Okay. 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 But clearly, we, we, we've got, yeah, let's put maybe think about it. Um, you make me look. Uh, so, <laughs> you, you clearly you have Balaam's donkey talking. So we know that we have situations in the Bible where an animal can speak when God makes, when God made vocal cords. He, you know, Gave animals intelligence. That's why animals dig us and like us. And animals look at you and tell, "Well, you're a nice person." He comes up to you and crawls in your lap because they they can interact and love us because they can sense whether we're good or not, and they can lick us and communicate with us through wagging of the tail and whatever. And Ben, you've got you know uh, big you know uh, golden retrievers, golden retrievers, uh, black lab, black labrador. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, black lab. What am I? Uh, and you you communicate with him. You know that he senses what your feelings are, and you can sense what his feelings are. And, and they simply can't talk to us unless God says so. And in this case, God says so. And in the garden, God allowed the serpent to have vocal cords that could speak. And with his speech, he said the following. He said to the woman, you know, has God said that you shouldn't eat of any of the trees of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the trees, the fruit of the trees of the garden. 
But the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you should not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And then the you know, serpent, you know, what he did first is he caused the woman to doubt the world. Are you sure that he said you couldn't eat all of the fruit of the tree? What version of the Bible did you do you have? Because I've got, you know, he has like, you know, that's why we have all these different Bible versions. So Satan can trick you into thinking you got the wrong one. In the right version, it says homosexuality is not a sin. Which one do you have? We got the King James. That's the wrong one. You should have the Alexandrian Bible. The Alexandrian Bible is cutting all gender stuff out altogether anyway. The next version of the Alexandrian Bible, they won't even have personal pronouns. It won't be he and she in there anymore at all. Homosexuality will be okay. Everybody will be able to do whatever they want. Don't worry about it. That, that'll be the next edition will be coming out. So he tells her you got the wrong version of the Bible. So you don't really know what he said, except that Eve and Adam were able to talk to God face to face. So they didn't have to go to a version of the Bible and read it and make sure they had the right. They were told directly what was okay and what was not okay. So she had no excuse. And so once he knew, he saw that look in her eyes. I was a little distracted. Did he say, I'm trying to think, did he say that we couldn't? Yeah, or did he say that we, we shouldn't? Which means that if we could, want to, yeah. was it could or shouldn't? You know, and once he saw her doubting the word of God that was spoken directly to her by God, he confronts her directly and calls God a liar. He says, you shall not surely die. He's lying to you. Because he knows that in the day you eat thereof, of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil that he's trying to withhold from you, that occulted knowledge that he's trying to hide from you will make you, little Eve, into a goddess. Does that sound like something that might interest you? Huh? Who would want to be a goddess? She's like, what? What is that? Like, it's just like a female deity. People will worship you. Oh, man. Like, there's not... Nowhere else in the universe is the one. You'll be the first. You'll be the only goddess in the whole universe. How does that sound? Does that sound like something you'd be interested in? And sure enough, you can see it laid out word for word. It says, wow, for God doth know in the day that you eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods and one good evil. He is promising her goddesshood if she partakes of occultic knowledge. She is the first of all of the Wiccans. Witchcraft. Hidden knowledge. She partakes of hidden knowledge. Why? Verse 6 says, And the woman, when she saw that the tree was good for food, and look, look sexy, it's, it's the lust of the flesh, and it was pleasant to the eyes, again, lust of the flesh, desire of the flesh, it was good for food, boom, desires. Pleasant to the eye, lust of the flesh, and a tree desirable to make one wise, which is what witchcraft and Wicca is all about obtaining occultic knowledge to make you a wise one so you can have more power than everybody else because you have knowledge that other people don't have. It's hidden from them, the normal people, you know, the mundanes, but you are supernatural, so you have hidden knowledge. And she says, when she saw those things, it was good for food, it's going to taste good, mm, yummy. Uh, it's desirable and pleasant to the eyes, looks good, and it was desirable to make one wise. It can make me a goddess. She took up the fruit thereof and did eat. And then the transitional that concludes that sentence, and she gave also unto her husband, and he did eat. And then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked. Wow, that cult of knowledge didn't make them into gods. It made them aware, and there was some, some you know, Satan takes a little bit of the truth and mixes it in with a little bit of a lie. So it was kind of true, like God. They knew good and evil. For the first time, they knew that they were naked and they were ashamed. They knew what evil was. They, didn't, they were innocent like a child of evil. They knew nothing of it. God knew what evil was, but they didn't because they were childlike and innocent. But when they ate of the, the, the knowledge of good and evil, they knew, oh, now I understand what shame is. Oh, now I understand for the very first time fear. They were afraid. For the first time ever, a human being was afraid. What were they afraid of? They were afraid of, not the devil, they were afraid of God. Mm -hmm. Their sin had separated them from the God that had created them from out of nothing. And they were naked and ashamed of themselves and afraid God's going to get us. Oh no, what should we do? 
That's hard. You don't want to see him. And so the God who had been their friend hours earlier in the day, now, in their minds, had become their enemy. And they weren't running to hide from Satan, the devil. They were running to hide from God himself. And it says, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. You know that verse in the Bible that says, you know, God dwelleth in unapproachable light, which no man can approach there to. Because his righteousness is so awesome that our wickedness, we are repelled by it. And we can't walk into the righteousness of the Lord in our fallen bodies where we would disintegrate. And so Adam and Eve now knew that they had lost their innocence and purity that made them righteous. And when God came down in literal, physical personage, they couldn't bear to be in his presence because they were ashamed. They knew that they were unclean. You know, if you went into, you know, a black tie event and you were covered in months old tattered clothes that smelled of stale urine and the like, and you saw some some dignitaries, you'd be like, oh, I don't want them to see me, you know, oh my gosh, I know that guy from working as a, you, like, you, you know, absent yourself from the, the festivities until you could be more appropriately attired in the future, lest they remember you in your fallen state. And that's what Adam and Eve did when they, when they heard God walking in the cool of the day. And essentially, Oh, I've heard some theologians say, and then God called Adam and Eve, and da da da. He didn't call Adam and Eve. No. He called Adam. Adam, where are you? Why? Because Adam was the head of the corporate family. Eve's great sin was that she took matters into her own hand and usurped, usurped her husband's authority. William Don was, was pointing out in his commentaries that what the woman should have done is gone to her husband and discussed it with him. Honey, I was, you know, you know, the servant came to me and said that, you know, I should eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And of course, she had done that. He would shut that idea down. But look, he, he said, what? That's an outrage. Absolutely not. We're not going to do it. Where is he? And then he would have gone and dealt with the serpent on his own. But she usurped her husband's authority and made her own decision for the entire family. And then... She got him through the powers of influence that she has over him because she's his wife and he's in love with her. She got him to go along with it. So not only did she make the family decision that the head of the household, the man, is supposed to make, but then she used her unique powers as a woman to, I don't want to say henpeck, this, you know, but she, she seduced and manipulated the spirit of her husband to follow along after. Because it's pointed out clearly in Scripture where Paul lays out, Adam was, it was Eve that was deceived. Adam was never deceived. Adam willingly rebelled because he made a checks and balances, balance and test decision. My wife, or for God. My wife, or God. God loves me. My wife loves me. God is my friend. <laughs> I'm going with my wife. And he decides to choose the wife, hotness, and, and, and their intimacy over, you know, kind of walking in the cool of the day with God. And God becomes the second class citizen. And Adam willingly rebels, which is why his punishment is greater than that of the woman. The woman gets childbirth, you get pain, you get discomfort when she's having a baby. But Adam gets death. And attributed to him is the death of every other creature in the universe. It's Adam's fault. When Bammy the deer dies in the woods, it's Adam's fault. It's not Adam and Eve's fault. It's Adam's fault. Why? Because Adam was in charge. Now, Eve usurped his authority, and her punishment was that your desire would be towards your husband. That is to rule over your husband, but he's going to rule over you. He's going to have authority over you, and I'm going to see to it that he maintains that. And you're going to rebel against that for all time until we get to the end of the 70th week. That's her punishment judgment, but Adam's judgment and punishment is much more severe. You are going to die, and everybody that dies along with you, including all of your children, will die because of you. And everybody will hold you accountable for their death. So when we bury a little baby, oh, it's so sad he died of juvenile onset leukemia. It's not Adam and Eve's fault. It's Adam's fault. And it's been accounted and imputed that way every death since then. You know, Satan doesn't get the blame for it. Eve doesn't get the blame for it. Sometimes they blame God. 
But Adam is the guy that, that holds, you know, the bag on that. Why? Because he was in charge, and he knew better, and he should have said no to his wife. But he didn't say no. And so now he's responsible for everything that she did, as well as everything that he did, and the servant. <clears throat> so, tragic, tragic, tragic. And so they hide themselves because they are naked and ashamed now. And then, in verse 11, you know, or verse 10, after God calls Adam, his man, the guy he put in charge, he says, uh, Adam, where are you? And Adam says, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Verse 11, he says, who told you you were naked? And I was like, what you talking about? <laughs> well, you know you're naked. Where'd you, you, where'd you read that? I don't ever remember teaching you that word. Hast thou eaten of the tree where I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? What does Adam do? He makes an excuse. He says, let me explain. Instead of just yes or no, did you eat of it? Yes, I ate of it. That's the answer. That's the end of the conversation. Now we'll move on to the next time. But his response was, let me explain. The woman that you gave to me, ah, well, she gave to me, and I ate. Huh? So this is really your fault. <laughs> huh? I mean, your creative genius is beyond question, but you, I don't know. It's a good you're, job, man. you're sleeping on the job when you made the woman. She gave it to me, and I ate. And so, you know, God you know, looks over, and it says, the Lord God said to the woman, and it, this is what you would call a, in, in, a, in, in a literary circles, a rhetorical question. Mm -hmm. This is a question that is not begging for a response. This is a statement being made couched in the form of a question. And God looks over at Eve and says, what is this that thou hast done? He's not asking for a question because he knows what she did. She doesn't know what she did yet. He's elucidating and clarifying to her and beginning the educational process that what you've done, you have no idea, but you're going to learn soon what it is that you've done. And so the woman volunteers gratuitously in response to the rhetorical question, well, the serpent beguiled me. In other words, he tricked me and I did eat. God didn't refute that. He's like, okay, yeah, you were naive and, and he tricked you. And so he turns to the serpent and says, because you've done this, tricked Eve into eating the fruit, who then seduced her husband into eating the fruit, because you've done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field, and upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thus thou shalt eat all the days of thy life. Some people believe that the serpent, which was the body or the form that, that Satan took when he was speaking to Eve in the garden, as sort of a relative or a uh, continuing symbol of God's punishment upon Satan that he took the reptile's ability to walk. The serpent, you know, has no legs. You know, he, you know the alligator and crocodile, they, they pretty much don't have legs either. They almost have them, but they kind of like waddle around and whatever. Um, and so, some people believe that this was sort of a punishment on the creatures known as serpents or snakes as a sort of a symbol, same way the rainbow is a promise in the sky that God will never destroy for the world again with the flood, that snakes rolling around on their legs back in the garden, they might have had legs and maybe had wings and could fly and do all kinds of wonderful things, which is where we get the idea of dragons, which were basically serpents that had wings and feet and arms. But as a, as a symbol of God's judgment upon Satan, they were stripped of their of their their limbs and had to crawl on the dust of the ground. So, you know, that's not doctrine, but that, that's been suggested. But what he does say is, I will put enmity between thee, Satan, and the woman. And between, and this is where the key phrase comes up, between thy seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So, in, in the McDonald commentary and a bunch of other commentaries, it says, in the McDonald commentary, it says, this verse makes reference to God putting enmity or warfare between the woman and between the people 
of the serpent. That's almost getting it right. It's saying here literally that thy seed, if the woman has seed, meaning biological offspring, and in the same sentence makes reference to the serpent and his seed, then he must also necessarily be saying that the serpent will have biological offspring. And that biological offspring will be, I would submit to you, none other than the Nephilim and the Antichrist, who will be a type or a descendant of the Nephilim, which are humanoids in human form, but are indwelt by the spirit of the fallen chair of Satan himself. Because it's in the same sentence, verse 15, I'll put enmity, warfare between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. And we know that women don't have seed. The Hebrew word there is zera. Zera is something that women don't have. Men have seed. This is a prophetic reference. This verse is referred to as the Proto-Evangelion, the first of all of the good news, that the Messiah will be born. But he will be born, it is hinted at in verse 15, of a virgin because Seed comes from a man and enters into a woman and impregnates her. Here, it doesn't reference to the seed of the man. Why doesn't it make reference, I'm going to raise up the seed of Adam, and he's going to make war against your seed. No, it says I'm going to raise up the seed of the woman. Women don't have seed, so it is making reference to the fact that the Messiah who would rise up to go to war to rectify what happened in the garden would be of a virgin born. But... If you're taking that as literally making reference to a biological descendant of Eve, which we know Jesus was, he is a true son of Adam. Also the son of God. He's also the son of God because God caused the seed to put. But if that is making a reference to a biological descendant of Eve, then when he transitions over and says, I'm going to make him have warfare against your seed, who is he talking to? Thy seed. He's talking to Sir. Satan. So Satan had, must necessarily also have a biological descendant that the biological descendant of Eve can have a war with. And that person is none other than the Antichrist, which is predicted in the very first gospel, the Proto-Evangelion, the first promise of the Messiah, also is promising that the Antichrist is coming. But the Antichrist will be defeated by Jesus. Now, that's not going to happen for 6,000 years yet at the Battle of Armageddon, but it's predicted right here in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And so, again, we, we indicated that's the start of the long war against God. Now, when we pick up next week, we will look at the verse in Genesis chapter 6 that makes reference and supports my contention that the Antichrist is an actual biological descendant of Satan. Let's look at it real quick, and we'll just hit upon it, and we'll, we'll pick it up and, and take more time with it next week. So, Steve, if you would, Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Fast forward a few, uh, you know, centuries later, Adam and Eve are cast out of the garden, and they start having children, and children, and the children, and they start having kids and whatever. Because God says, be fruitful and, and multiply and, and fill the earth with what? Children of men. Sons of Adam, daughters of Eve. The children of men are now filling the planet earth for the first time because God commanded it to be so. Now we get to Genesis chapter 6, several centuries later, and we find out the following, Steve. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God said the daughters of men that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always thrive with man, but that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. And there were giants of the earth in those days, and also after that. And the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men which were of old. That is so very, very key. You've got to follow us here. We're going to look at this again next week when we have time to go into it in detail, but I just want to leave this with you so that you can cogitate and sort of yeah. 
sort of think it over, because this is the most controversial four verses anywhere in the Bible. This is even more controversial than the concept or the doctrine of the rapture. People go to war over this. You know, godly men will stand up and say, this cannot possibly mean what it says. It's got to mean something else. Because what it says is very plain. What it says is that when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, after Adam and Eve got kicked out of the garden and told to have babies and fill up the earth with the children of men, it says daughters were born into them. It says that the sons of God, which in the Hebrew is made reference to as the Beneha Elohim, which is what, you know, the, the Bible is originally Old Testament written in Hebrew. And so the phrase there was the Beneha Elohim, the sons of God, saw the Benoth Adam. That Hebrew phrase means the daughters of men. The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, meaning pretty, they were looking good, and they took them wives of all whom they chose. Now what is that saying? Who are these sons of God? The sons of God everywhere else. Look in the book of Job and you see that same phrase repeating itself over and over and over again. The Beneha Elohim, the sons of God, are always making reference to the angels that God created before Adam was created. The celestial creatures known as angels are referred to as the Bnei HaElohim, the sons of God, because they were directly made by the hand of God. They weren't born of another angel. They were made directly by the hand of God, which is why Adam, when you look at the genealogy of Jesus in the book of Matthew, and so-and-so begat so-and-so, and so-and-so -so, so -so was the son of Eber, and then so -so was the son of Eber, and then so -so was the son of Noah, and Noah was the son of Seth, and Seth was the son of Seth, da -da 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 -da. until you get to Adam, and it says, Adam, who was the son of God, because God made him directly. The angels were made directly by the hand of God. So they were referred to always as the Bnei Ha Elohim. And then it says, these Bnei Ha Elohim, the angels, saw the Benoth Adam, the daughters of Adam, or the daughters of man, that they were pretty, and they chose out the hottest ones of all of them and married them. How about that? Now that's a problem because God doesn't want angels to get married. And somebody says, oh, it says in the New Testament that Jesus himself said angels, uh, you know, they can't have kids. And, and, you know, no, it says the angels in heaven don't get married. It doesn't say they can't have kids. They can take on physical forms, and we know that, yeah. because they went to Lot in Sodom, mm -hmm. and they were some hot-looking men. They ate with them, they left. Sat down, had dinner, you know, and they were so good-looking, the homosexual men of Sodom said, bring them out, that we can have sexual intercourse with them. He goes, no, no, please take my virgin daughters that no man has ever touched, but do not do this evil thing, because in those days they had a tradition like, Whatever harm befell a guest, that was your fault. Yeah. And he knew that these guests came directly from the throne room of God. He knew who they were. He was like, he, you know, I love my daughter. He wasn't saying he hated his daughter. He was saying that I would rather you rape and sexually molest my, my children and the fences on me than you sexually molest the sons of God who have come to spend the night in my house. That, I can't, I can't allow God's children to be molested in my house. Take my daughters. And they will step aside. We will take care of this. And he struck them with blindness, took Lot and his family out, and brought her. Hellfire and brimstone down and nuked the whole city. And the one next to it, Simon and Laura, the seas on the plain, were incinerated by brimstone and fire. A nuclear conflagration because God was so upset with the sexual perversion that was going on in Simon and Laura, which was men having sex with other men. And animals too, probably. But it was men having sex with other men, which God said, this is wrong. And that upset him. And God also says angels can't have sex with men or women. But they did it anyway. Because it says these angels, the Bnei Ha'el, he picked out the fairest, the prettiest of the daughters of, of, of men and married them. And chose them wives of all whom they chose. And that's why I said to you, you know, when Phil was talking about sort of uh, the, the Aryan race, the myth those attached to that is that these Aryan star men were like these celestial beings that came down into the Caucasus Mountains, long blonde hair and these incredibly muscular bodies, and they looked in 
incredibly gorgeous. And you just sort of fell in love with him. Like, oh my gosh, look at him. He's like, you know, like, you know, uh, Christopher Hemsworth and playing Thor and the Avengers or something. Only ten times more hot than that. And um, so these guys apparently had to be pretty attractive to be able to just walk into town. And say, uh, you little missy, what's your name? Oh, I'm Tiffany. You come with me, girl. Well, my dad. Come with me. Okay. And then, boom, they take them off and build a house and they marry them and got them pregnant. And how do I know that? I'm not making that up because it says so. It says the Bnei Elohim saw the daughters of men that they were fair and took them wives of all whom they chose. And then God got mad. In verse 4, we find out why. It says because there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. The word in the Hebrew is Nephilim. The word Nephilim means the fallen ones. So in Hebrew it says there were the fallen ones in the earth in those days. They happened to be giants, but what the word means is the fallen ones, as in fallen angels came down to earth and picked out wives for themselves. And also after that, when what? When the sons of God, the angels, came in unto the daughters of men, and then it says, and they bear children to, to them. They didn't go to the adoption agency, right? The, the angels didn't walk down the street with the pretty girls from the neighborhood and say, we, we want to adopt a kid because we love each other. We want to raise kids together. No, it says they bear children to them, which means that the angels came down in humanoid form and had sexual intercourse with the daughters of men and somehow was able to impregnate them with their genetic material so that they could create perverted replicas who came out looking awesome because we find out in the next transitional portion of that sentence the same making reference to what the children that came out of the womb of the daughters of men who had been impregnated by the sons of God the angels they produced offspring who became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. And in Hebrew, they're referred to as the hot giborim. And the giborim is the same Hebrew term that's made reference to later on in uh, First and Second Kings and Chronicles when it's talking about the Nephilim, the race of supermen who were giants that went to war with Israel. They are referred to as the giborim. And here we find out that the first of these mighty men or these gibberim are the result of angels coming down and having sexual intercourse and impregnating the daughters of men. And it says, these became the mighty men which were of old, men of renown. That's a fancy way of saying it. these guys are the guys that people wrote legendary stories about. Atlas, Ajax, Hercules, Thor. Uh, what's the guy who got shot in the, uh, in the Achilles heel, you know? Achilles. Achilles, uh, uh, no, Achilles was, Achilles, was it, no, no it was. Hercules? No. Achilles was shot on the way he was, uh, Was it Achilles heel? Narcissus. No, Narcissus is the guy who looked in the, in, in okay, the no, yeah. water and fell up. But it was, uh. Oh man, what was the guy who's like the Trojan War? He was like the super, he was the what? super warrior. His name was, and he got killed because, because his weak spot was, they had dipped him in some magic water or something, and the witch held him by his, his heels yeah. so that the water, the magic water didn't cover his, his heels. His name was, um, it was Achilles. Because it's Achilles, yeah, yes. it's Achilles heel because it's the heel of, of Achilles. Well, it was, because uh, they, they even had him, Brad Pitt played Pitt him movie. in that movie. What was the name of the movie? Troy, remember the movie? Troy, Brad Pitt played, was it Achilles? Was it? <laughs> it, it would make sense. It would make sense. Who was it that he fought against? He, he uh, Hector. You're right. You're right. It's Hector and Achilles. So, so there you have it. So these guys became legendary sort of figures. And they said, oh, but that's mythology. But mythology is simply stories told about individuals who actually did exist at one time. They changed names, like we got Achilles, and then we had you know, Ajax, and then we had 
Hector, who was the great champion of the Trojans, and he was fighting against the great Greek champion, who was Achilles, and there you have it. And now we look, sort of look, oh, but that's, that's mythology. Hercules never really existed. Maybe he did really exist, and we've made stories about him, and people change the story to fit whatever their particular culture is, just like the Chinese have a flood story about people living in an ark that escaped from a flood, and you have... You know, Assyrians have the same legendary story, and they might have different names. But what this verse is saying, Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, is saying that long ago and far away, angels actually did come down to earth in the form of men and impregnate human women. And the babies that were born became supermen who became the legendary figures of Greek, Norse, and all mythology that we've written stories about, we've read about since we were kids. And now... We have them replaced by what? Superheroes. Marvel and DC, Superman, Batman, Thor, and, uh, Spider-Man, and all these super entities that have superpowers that we idolize and worship as if they were God. So, all this is saying is that this actually did in fact occur, and, and we'll finish up right here in Genesis chapter 6, uh, verse 9. Steve, go ahead and read that for us. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Okay, let's break that down real quick. These are the generations of Noah. Generations is another way of saying what the, the, the right, the, the descendants, the biological genetic descendants of Noah are these. Noah was a just man. Okay, so he followed the law. And he was tamayim, is the Hebrew word, perfect in his attitude, in his desires, in his heart towards God. No, it says he was perfect in his generations, which is the only way in Old Testament Hebrew you could say DNA. The word DNA had been created. The oxyribonucleic acid had not yet been discovered yet. And so this was the closest way of making reference to a person's genetics. Noah was tamayim, meaning unblemished in his DNA. It wasn't saying that Noah was sin free because if he had been, he could have died on the cross for all of us and we could have stopped the madness and Jesus wouldn't have had to come 2,000 years later. We could have had Noah die for our sins because he was the only perfect man. No, it wasn't saying that he was sin free. It's saying that his DNA was not contaminated. How, how would you contaminate? You, know, you could contaminate somebody's clothing by throwing something at them. How would you contaminate somebody's genes? which exists inside the cell by having sex with a non-human whose germline cells invade the germline cells of the human. The egg and the sperm, those are germline cells. The sperm penetrates the wall of the egg, fertilizes it when the nucleus of the sperm penetrates the ovum, and wow, that egg now becomes fertilized by the spermatozoa that comes from the germline of the man called the sperm. Well, in this case, the germline cell came from a fallen angel, and it, instead of the nucleus of a son of Adam, it was the nucleus of a fallen angel fertilizes the egg of a human woman, creating a superman. But this, is, in God's eyes, was a perversion so great that God had to do what? to ensure the existence of the sons of, of Adam, the children of men. He had to do what? Destroy the earth of the flood. Say it. The flood. The flood. Yes, the flood. And why did he have to destroy the world of the flood? Because the Nephilim, the descendants of the fallen angels and the human, are stronger, bigger, more powerful than the sons of Adam. They were taking all of the food. They were taking all of the land. And they were able to fight off and kill off the men. The men were terrified. Of, they were giants. They were supermen. And they threatened to eradicate not only all the sons of Adam from the earth, or at the very least, they would contaminate. If you put, you know, let's say a Norwegian girl with an African guy on a, on a desert island, and they have children, the children are going to be both Norwegian and African. And all their children's children will be Norwegian and African, right? And so if you take a fallen angel 
and a human woman and put them on a desert island and have children, all of their offspring will be both fallen angel and human female. They will be hybrid children. And Jesus came to earth as what? He called himself the son of man. He called himself a son of Adam because he was biogenetically of the seed of the woman with no male DNA contributing the Holy Spirit impregnated her, but he was completely fully human and fully and completely God. But what he wasn't was a hybrid. He wasn't a Nephilim. God didn't become a Nephilim to die for the sins of the Nephilim. He became a man to die for the sins of mankind, which means if there had been no pure Adamic humans left on the earth because they had all interbred with women who had interbred with fallen angels and all of their offspring were both man and fallen angel, then you couldn't have had a Messiah. God could not have come into the human race because it would have been contaminated already with demonic DNA. Jesus would have been born in a de demonically contaminated body if he had been born of a Nephilim. So God, in order to preserve the pure genetic germline of Adam, not because Adam is sin-free, but because it was uncontaminated genetically, he had to wipe out all of the Nephilim from the earth so they couldn't continue to impregnate women and eventually create a whole hybrid race. The whole human race would have been hybrid. Yeah. There would have been no pure Adamic humans anymore. We would have all been part demon, part human. And so the Messiah could never have come. Not because he didn't have the power to, but because he would have had to come through a demonically contaminated vessel, which would have made him contaminated too. So God took the extreme measure of destroying all life on earth with the flood. Now that explains why God took such measures. Because, you know, the God, people who hate God say, oh, it's so cruel. He, he's a genocidal maniac. He killed everybody on the flood. Why would he do that? Because he's mad about sin? No, there have always been sinners on earth. There were sinners in Sodom and Gomorrah. God took care of them from homosexuality, but he didn't destroy all people on earth. He took out those two cities, but everybody else on earth is allowed to continue on. Now, Las Vegas and New York City, they have sinners there, and people do sins, but God hasn't wiped out New York City. He hasn't wiped out San Francisco because homosexuality is in San Francisco. Why did he wipe out all the sins? No, he is tolerant, not willing that any should perish. But in this extreme instance, in Genesis chapter 6, he had to wipe out all creatures on because Satan and the fallen angels had taught men how to genetically engineer hybrid humans, not only with fallen angels, but also with animals. And again, when you look in the Apocrypha, you see that there's reference of the angels teaching humans how to interbreed with animals as well, which is where you get the mythology of, you know, the chimera, the Gorgon, the Baphomet, bull-headed man, body of a man, head of a goat. You know, these creatures actually did look at all of the gods of Egypt. There's a god with a falcon head, Horus. There's a god with a cow head. I forgot the name of that. Half a horse, the cow-headed god, uh, who's half woman, half, half cow. You know, the falcon-headed god is Horus, who had the body of a man and the head of a falcon. These aren't just mythological archetypes, I believe these are actually hybrid entities that actually existed and interacted with the people of these various cultures, whether it be Assyria or Egypt, prior to the flood, which is why we have a myth of the lost city of Atlantis, because some people think and have suggested that Atlantis was the capital city of the Nephilim, and that they, like Nimrod, were building a world empire but it was dominated over by the supermen who were more powerful, more intelligent, had all kinds of super abilities, and they would have dominated the children of men and enslaved them. And God had to destroy that city of Atlantis with their Nephilim king, which is where you have the myth of Poseidon as the king of the sea. You know, Atlantis probably was just a powerful city like New York City on an island, sitting off in the Aegean Sea somewhere. And when God caused the flood to occur, that city was no longer above sea level. It became below sea level. And then the myth you know, sort of got attached to it that Atlantis is the city beneath the sea. It wasn't always beneath the sea. It was at one point above the sea until God put it under the sea when he brought the flood to destroy 
all of the Nephilim who were, though they were descendants of the angels who were celestial beings that can't die, because they were also part men, they had lungs and hearts, and they could breathe, and they needed breath, and they needed calories, and they needed food, so they could be killed off with the flood. And when God did that, he was able to sort of, it's just like reboot the computer and you wipe the slate clean. And now we have genetically pure Adamic humans. How? Because he put Noah and his wife and his three kids and their wives in the ark and preserved their DNA as well as all the creatures that were on the earth at that time. But the most important precious cargo wasn't the cows or the dinosaurs or the wolves or coyotes that came along there. The most precious cargo was the human DNA that survived the flood into the new world that we are now in so that the Messiah could come and be a son of Adam, the son of man. The son of man has come not to, to seek and save that which is lost. He referred to himself as the son of man far more times than he referred to himself as the son of God. Ingrid, you had a question. Uh, well, it's just like a comment on an article that I read recently uh, in the study that we rats mm. and uh, they were able to reproduce the rat without the egg of a female. They were able to take whatever I guess the DNA to make a, a false embryo mm -hmm. essentially and use the sperm and create a rat. So the thought process it went further into the article saying well with this revelation may be possible to then just take anybody's DNA, mm -hmm. a man, yep. who's married to yep. a man, yep. huh? okay, and married men can possibly in the future yep. take, you know, take sperm and, you know, the other guy, so I wonder at that point, wow, how that's just recreating and how, you know. I've read, I've read the same thing, you know, I, I follow genetics because it's just fascinating because I think it ties so much into what we learn in the Bible. Mm -hmm. and. That's why, you, you know, the Messiah couldn't come today because of things like that. Back in, in the time that Jesus came, men didn't know. They didn't have the occultic knowledge that Satan imparted to us about human genetic engineering and how to take a, you know, instead of taking a germline cell, which means an egg or a sperm cell, you can now take any cell that has a nucleus, extract the nucleus, and stick it into another cell with a nucleus and have them combine, even if one of those cells is not an oocyte or an egg cell, which means you can replicate without having to have a girl, which means two men could get married and go to the geneticist and do some tomfoolery in the genetics lab and take Steve's DNA and somehow monstrously combine it together with Ben's DNA and create a third entity, a chimera, a hybrid human made up of the DNA of two different men, and no girl would need to be involved. So who's their kinsman redeemer? I mean, wow. Right. Oh, that's the thing. That's, that's, yeah. So do they, do they even have a kin? And that's when we get later on into the book of Revelation, you see these creatures are hybrids, mm -hmm. and the hybrids are part of the army of the Antichrist, mm. and some of them look like men. They have mm. fingers and toes and heads and faces, but they are not one of us. And that wow. is how you know. This is oh. not J.R.R. Tolkien I'm talking yeah. about. This is not C.S. Lewis and the Tales of Narnia we're talking We're talking about Popular Science or Genetics Today magazine writing articles about how you can take nuclei from two different males and create a third type of individual called a chimera and you can splice in genes from different entities so that there's endless, limitless variations. You could take Steve's DNA, put it with Ben's DNA, take a bull's DNA and, and put it with the DNA of a hawk and create a man with wings. So that's how those crazy creatures in the new we there read in Revelation. There you have it. And that's why now we don't have to take the book of Revelation as an allegorical book, as the Catholic Church says. Now we know that we have the genetic wherewithal to do that today. Mm. We can do that. It's against the law to take human DNA and combine it with animals, but it can be done, and we've done it. We've taken human DNA and combined it with animals to build ears on the backs of mice. Why? So that when people get in automobile accidents or people at the Burn Center at the University of Michigan Hospitals, 
probably the best in the, all the world. And sometimes, you know, skin at a certain temperature melts like wax. And when you are in a fire, like, kid will lose his ears because it will just melt off. You won't have it anymore. There'll be nothing to, to surgically repair. It's gone. But the idea is, if you can take the genes that are related to growing human artifacts like an ear, put it on the back of a pig or a mouse, and I've seen the mouse with human ears growing out of its back, it's a simple thing when you need to kill the little mouse. Sorry, Mickey. You know, kill the mouse and pull the ear off and attach it to the head of a kid. And it's now functional. And so that's the idea. It's, it, there's, you, there's always a therapeutic use. And, and just like in Nazi Germany and just like with your mother, there's always, there always seems that I, I was listening to that movie we saw when we uh, expelled. Remember the sign he said? You know, they, they always make an incredibly rational sounding explanation as to why genocide and euthanasia for the elderly is a good idea. It's, they always have a good idea as to why this would be good for society, but it always turns out to be some kind of a monstrosity, and that's exactly what they're doing now. They're trying to justify combining human DNA with animal DNA to create chimeras, and they say, oh, but, but no, it'll be mostly animal, and they will kill the animal and harvest the human organ. But what, what happens when you don't? And what happens when more of the genes are human than animal? So that <laughs> instead of having a mouse born with a human ear growing out of his back, you have a human born with a rat tail growing out of his butt or wings growing out of his back like in the X-Men movie series. That's exactly what we are capable of doing in a laboratory right now. And if you think it hasn't been done already, you all are naive. We are living in a brave new world that is much scarier than what you realize. And because of that, in and of itself, the Lord has to intervene. Because like you said, a couple generations down the road, there won't be any humans left. There'll be no sons of Adam for Jesus to come back for. Because we will be interspliced with these hybrids that Satan has planned all along to replace. Take human DNA, splice it, manipulate it, and change it into his own image so he can create a race of hybrids created in his image. Humans are created in the image of God, and we are a reminder to him every time he sees one of us that God is the Lord and judgment is coming. He's going to co-opt the DNA molecule because he can't create DNA out of nothing like God can and change it and fashion it so it is now restructured in his own image. So that he'll have his own race of people to rule over. That's why the people that are in the Illuminati or people that are in Satanism and people that are in the occult are foolish for joining up with, oh, Satan, he could win in the end. And he's going to give you, Jay-Z and Luma, that's what, that's what the Rihanna song Umbrella is about. When all the crap starts to come down, you can stand under my umbrella, Satan is saying, to her, I'm going to protect you financially, I'm going to protect you from the storm that's coming when the New World Order transitions from the Old World Order. No, he's not. He's going to get rid of her and Jay-Z too. As soon as he can, he's going to take their DNA, make it into a DNA fashion in his own image, Antichrist, and all these hybrid superhumans, the Nephilim, are going to replace the sons of Adam. The children of men will be replaced with the Nephilim eventually, according to Satan's plan. And at Armageddon, you're going to see that's exactly what's happening. You're going to have the Antichrist and his Nephilim army of hybrid humans going to war with Jesus Christ and the church that comes back fighting for the remaining souls, the remaining human beings that are left, the remnant of Israel, and the few remnant of Gentiles that have not yet taken the mark of the beast, which I have suggested for years now, is a subcutaneous biogenetic chip that can rewrite your nucleotidal order so that your genes are now being rewritten so that you become something other than an Adamic human. You become a superman. But the people are going to eat it like, what? I I won't have male pattern baldness? Nope. And I'll have a ripped body like the guys in the Olympics? Yep, you won't even have to go to the gym. How about that? You serious? Sign me up, dude. Just get this chip right here. It's going to cost you about three or four hundred million dollars, though. But for a limited time only, because this new governmental leader, the Antichrist, he's got one available for every man. No kid left behind. If you sign on the dotted line, you get your very own chip for a limited time only. Free. We know you can't go out and sell your house and, you know, whatever, get three or four jobs and be able to, for the six-month period of time, he's giving one to everybody. Are you serious? 
oh, I love him. That's a, that's, yeah. And people are going to be fighting to get the chip. People are going to fight to take the mark of the beast. But when they do, it will be genetically changed from, as you said, Adamic humans to Nephilim. And Jesus didn't die for the Nephilim. So what does that mean? Once you take the mark of the beast, you can't get saved anymore. Even if you repent and ask Jesus to forgive you, he can't. Because his price was paid back to God for the sins of the sons of Adam. If you are the son of Adam, the payment he's already made in advance doesn't qualify. You're not qualified for this loan, my friend. You're not covered in this policy. You have written yourself out of the policy written in blood by the son of Jesus. And only you can do it by taking the mark of the beast. And so that's why. All of this ends up tying together, and that's why the rapture has got to happen first. If people understand the horrors that are coming down the road just a little piece from now, when the Antichrist is finally revealed, they wouldn't suggest that going through the tribulation period is such an awesome thing, this great thing that, you know, oh, I'm going to prove how tough I am. What that is is a works-based theology where people think that Jesus did part of the work, but when Steve and I get our double barrel shotguns, and then Ingrid, she's going to be in charge of the clean drinking water, and we're going to have a hydroponic garden set up, and then we're going to do bottles, and we're going to go out and march, and we're going to like occupy Wall Street, and we're going to be telling the Antichrist where to shove it, you know, and that's going to be cool. That's not what's going to happen. What's going to happen is children are going to be molested and murdered, and people are going to be forced to turn themselves into zombies, hybrid monstrosities that are no longer human, or they'll be starved to death and murdered. And they're going to do it because they want to live. And that's going to be a horrible period of time that God is not going to allow his son's bride, the church, to go through. Which is why the rapture has to happen first. And then all of this nightmare world that we are looking at will be a reality for our neighbors and our loved ones and everyone left behind. So it is incumbent upon us to make sure that that doesn't happen. So while my friend's funeral is Saturday, it's at the wrong time. 10 o'clock. So, like Jesus let the dead bury their own dead. We got living people that we need to go and preach the gospel to, and that's what we're going to do, because that's the role of the church. And with that, I'm done. Do we have any questions or comments? Have at it. Oh, just uh, using the name of uh, Achilles, which is yeah. Achilles. Her yeah. mother's name is the name Thetis. What was the name again? Thetis. How do you spell it? T H E T I S, right? That is, yeah. So she 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 hung him upside down in the yes. river, right? What was the name of the river? Do you remember? Six. It's like six. Oh, the river Six, which is of course supposedly the river that leads down into Hades. Yeah. I didn't know it was the river Six. <laughs> wow! How he was killed by Paris. Paris killed him, right? Paris shot him with the arrow. Exactly. He had, he had defeated Hector, who was the great champion of the Trojans. And they're like, if he can beat Hector, he can beat anybody. And Paris, like, you know, we'll be going with a bow and arrow. He snuck up behind him and shot him in the heel, man. That almost seems unfair. It bothers me to this day. Well, I'm going to recon. Let play the video. He cheated, man. And he got him, man. He got the great champion of the Greeks, Achilles, who was dipped in, in the river Styx. And the river Styx, by the way, flows down into hell mm. and it is there that the hell side of the river sticks is guarded by the three-headed dog anybody remember the name oh. no. <laughs> see Cerberus. Cerberus close right remember Cerberus the three-headed dog and then you know, if you got past the three-headed dog, then you waited for the boatman to come. Yeah. You, had to, you gave a coin to the boatman, and what was the name of the boatman? That it would take you across the river Styx oh, into the underworld. Know. Also starts with the sea. Edward Gilgamesh has a similar trial. Is that right? Does the same, does the same thing. thing. Exactly. Yeah. Chiron, remember? Chiron, Chiron no, the boatman. No, yeah, yeah, no. The boatman of the river Styx. No, yeah. You paid Chiron your coin. And he gives you safe passage across the river, sticks past the three-headed dog. In Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh has to bring all of the trees because every time you put the, the ore in the water, 
it burns. Oh, so you have to put, oh, oh. like, he, he had to go out and chop out a ton of trees, put them on his boat, and then use all the boat, all the trees to get across to finally get to a place he has to bake something, wait for seven days, he falls asleep, it's too late, and he loses his opportunity. I used to think these, these mythological, I thought, man, who comes up with these? These, these are great stories, man. When I was a kid, I would read these things. But it's all because it's based in some kernel of truth. There really is an underworld. There really is a Hades. There really is a hell. And there really is a compartment in the earth where undead people are waiting judgment. And man, we have the full truth because we have the word of God, Jesus, the revelation, and we can give it to the people. That's what's exciting about all of this. And so, with that, unless the rapture happens before we get back next week, we will continue on part two.